Good afternoon, everyone. I really appreciate you being here. I am Jill Hartz, Executive Director of the museum. And we have, as you know, a fabulous exhibition upstairs, National Geographic, Greatest Photographs of the American West. So I'm assuming all of you have seen the show, yes? So not yet, no. Well, you have to go up after this if you haven't. But it is here through the end of the month, so tell others, come back. Um, we have other kinds of photography programs that are coming along during the fall in relation to this show, as well as our Corda exhibition and other works on view, kind of overviews of photography in general, as well as specific works in the collection. But we are thrilled today to have Rich Clarkson with us of Rich Clarkson and Associates. And as he will say more eloquently than I, um, this project originated with this book, which is an absolutely fabulous book, um, and has many more photographs in it than are in the exhibition, as wonderful and beautiful as the exhibition is. So um, do take a look at the book, which I have to say is at an incredibly reasonable price, too. So great holiday gift. Um, but as I said, um, we're delighted to have Rich here, and for a number of reasons. Um, first, of course, the publication in conjunction with American West. Um, and also, um, this isn't Rich's first time here. In fact, I don't know if we can count how many times he has been here. But perhaps most recently with Tracktown USA, some of you may have seen the exhibition that we did in our Pape room in conjunction with the book on Hayward Field. Um, and that show also was on view at the airport, which was really wonderful, too. Um, and then even before that, which is probably the first time that I met Rich, was when he was surprised by Brian Lanker, and I know many of you um, knew Brian, um, uh, for kind of a tribute event um, that really recognized his influence on so many photographers, both um, in photojournalism, National Geographic, and otherwise, as a mentor, friend, and um, I think that was when I realized kind of how important he is. But that was a wonderful, wonderful event. And then we are working with Rich and his company now on a possible retrospective of Brian's work. So stay tuned for that. Stay tuned for more on that one. Um, but Rich ha um, brings his own illustrious history to us. He, um, since his days as director of photography at the Topeka Capital Journal, he is perhaps um, well known, if not surprised, and certainly it's no surprise that he was a former director of photography and senior assistant editor at National Geographic Society. He has been assistant managing editor of the Denver Post and a contract and contributing photographer to Sports Illustrated. He founded his company in 1987 in Denver for the creation and management of unique projects based in various uses of fine photography. And he will return tomorrow to see their new offices. So I'm curious to know what he thinks about that. Among his many clients, and he has a number of different ongoing relationships, um, is that his company handles all championship photography for the NCAA. So um, I encourage you to Google Rich Clarkson and Associates and see all the wonderful things they do. But today, Rich will share um, his perspectives and information on photography of the American West. So please join me in welcoming Rich Clarkson. You know, one of the things that, that that's always kind of necessary to do is to always kind of figure out who you're talking to, uh, and uh, you know, it, 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 it's <laughs> you you should you should do it all the time, but sometimes you don't do it very well, and then you discover who it was that you were actually talking to. Uh, Western Kansas is certainly what we would consider a, a part of the American West. And very early in my career, when I was working at the Topeka Capital Journal, uh, on, a sun, on, on a Sunday morning, a horrific crime was discovered in Holcomb, Holcomb Kansas. In the bodies of all four members of a well-known family were found brutally slain. 
the agents of the Kansas Bureau of Investigation began their search for the killers, and there was two of them, and they found them within about two weeks, uh, Smith and Hickok, and they found them in Salt Lake City. Today, it would take a long time to find them, probably. And they were brought from Salt Lake City back to Garden City, Kansas, the, the county seat, to await the trial. And the trial started exactly two weeks after they were returned. Today, that would be two years with all kinds of filings and, and uh, uh, postponements and uh, all of those kinds of things. But at the time, this had really become a national story. And so lots of people were covering it because the Herbert Clutter family was well known in that part of the country. And to, to brutally murder all four members of the family, and they invaded their nice, very lavish farm home at, in, in the middle of the night, thinking that there would be a lot of cash there. And of course, there is no one keeps cash in their house. But now that's a big story, and, and so there must have been 15 or 20 reporters who were now during, in town during this two-week period between when they were found and returned and the trial actually began. And there were a lot of national reporters there, and, and this was back in the days in Kansas that uh, it was a, a dry state. You, you couldn't get a drink anywhere. Now, for reporters to be thrust into a dry state, that, that, that's a bit of a problem. And so thus it was that the editor of the Garden City Telegram made us all members of the American, uh, of, of the American Legion Club. <laughs> so that's where we could go to get a drink. <clears throat> and so we would go there every night, and this, this mousy little fellow from New York had shown up, and then... Uh, a number of the people there knew exactly who Truman Capote was, but you know some of the rest of us were, were figuring, it, figuring it out. So the writer from our newspaper was a guy by the name of Ron Call. And so all these writers were trying to interview everyone in Garden City about the, this upcoming trial and, and the Clutter family and all of that. And, and some of them were saying, gee, I, I just don't want to have to talk about this over and over. Couldn't. Uh, these three people all wanted to talk to me. Couldn't we do it all at the same time? So thus it was that, that Ron agreed that, that he would go out and, and share some of these interviews with Truman Capote. Well, Capote took, Capote took absolutely no notes at all. And Ron was writing furiously. And, and, and uh, Truman would go back to the motel where we were all staying, and he had this mousy little woman with him. And she would transcribe the notes uh, every night. And then they would come join us at the American Legion Club for, uh, for a drink and, and the dinner. And the dinner was basically, how do you want your T-bone steak? <clears throat> so it was, uh, you know, on about the fourth or fifth night, our writer, Ron Call, says to her, um, you're doing all the work for, for Truman Capote. You know, this, this should be your book. She says, no, that's fine. <clears throat> And he said, uh, wouldn't you like to write a book? And she says, well, I did. Ron says, well, fine. You know, did you get it published? <laughs> yeah, it was published this last year. How's it doing? Well, it, it's doing fine. Says, uh, what's the name of your book? Harper Lee says, To Kill a Mockingbird. <laughs> Always know who you're talking to when you start, <laughs> when you start talking. So uh, it, it, it's... For me, it's been kind of fun uh, 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 working with, with a lot of things over the years. And, and uh, this book originated a couple of years ago. We do some workshops at the National Museum of Wildlife Art in Jackson Hole. And Jim McNutt, who is their uh, uh, president, executive director, uh, said, uh, uh, I had an idea. He did his idea. He said, uh, th there's a group of Western museums, there's 10 or 11 of these museums, and I just think it would be really interesting to open an exhibition uh, of photographs, it's obviously going to have to be photographs, in all of these museums on the same day. So I said, well, yeah, that, that would be all right. He says, do you have any ideas what we could do? So, well, let, let me make a phone call. So I, I made a phone call right then and there to, uh, to Chris Johns, who, was, who is the editor-in-chief of the National Geographic magazine. I said, would, would, 
would you be willing to let me have access to all of the archives and all of the files uh, of the National Geographic to do an exhibition and a book on the great photographs of the American West? And he says, uh, yeah, you've got it. Uh, then I, I subsequently found out, it was probably because I worked there before, but also probably because I hired Chris Johns in his very first job out of school. Um, and, and school was Oregon State. So at any rate, he said, yep, you, you've, you've got it. So at, at, at that point, uh, we started moving on it. And so to me, the obvious thing was to go to another adjunct of the National Geographic, the, the magazine and the book division are quite separate. So I went to uh, the book division and said, would you be interested in doing a, a, a book on, to accompany an exhibition that would open in these museums on the great photographs of the American West? And they said, absolutely. Which gave me the unique uh, uh, opportunity to sell the National Geographic their own pictures. People have commented on that in the years since. <laughs> it's really interesting because the American West was really introduced to the rest of the nation, i.e. the East, uh, with photographs. It, it's really kind of interesting because uh, in, in the very early days as the West was being developed and, and settled, that there were um, some early day photographers led by William Henry Jackson who made photographs of this amazing part of the country that people didn't really know very much uh, about at all. And, and thus it was they began to find out about uh, the American West. They began to see all of the things that ha had never really been seen before. And it's really kind of interesting uh, with William Henry Jackson. Let, let, me write some, let me read something that uh, Jim McNutt wrote. On August 23rd, photographer William Henry Jackson, his team of assistants, 16 people, uh, uh, labored up a valley strewn with fallen timbers, slick rocks and bogs west of Eagle River in Colorado, seeking a route to view the legendary mountain of the Ho Holy Cross. Leaving the valley, uh, Jackson took two members of the team and ascended to a ridge to a vantage point on North Mountain hauling hundreds of pounds of photographic equipment up the last 1,500 feet, they spent a day above the clouds, which obscured the main subjects, but parted just at the right time. After a restless night at tree line, they arose to a clear, cold morning and a sunrise view of the snow-crossed mountain. Jackson had to wait for snow, snow melt to produce the water needed to wash his glass plates, because you had to do them in the field and altered the extension of one arm of the cross because one of the most popular photographs in the American West of the 19th century was that very view, symbolizing for the first time to all of those folks in the East, the American West that fulfilled a romantic destiny. It, it's really kind of interesting to watch how this all began to transpire because this goes back to the early days of the history of the National Geographic. And no single institution, even one with the reach of the National Geographic Society, can bear credit for the diverse and complex uh, associations that attach to the simple phrase, the West. Uh, nevertheless, the Geographic has regularly reported, photographed on the American West, published images from that form over all these years, the 125 plus years of the National Geographic Society. And uh, it is so interesting that it goes on and on and on. And today, the National Geographic continues to find stories of intent and, and, and uh, importance in, in the American West. Photographers have been fascinated by that American West probably more than any other part of the country. Uh, Ansel Adams could have been the foremost of, of the cadres of photographers who set up their tripods uh, from the Badlands to the Oregon shores. And even today, National Geographic photographers such as Jim Richardson, William Albert Allard, 
Joel Sartori, Michael Nichols, Franz Lanning, Jim Van Brandenburg. They record and have recorded the glamour and the beauty of this ever-changing scene. Today, those photographs take on even more significance just than the beauty and uniqueness of so many diverse places because today the photographs are being used in such a way as to point out what we need to do to take care of the American West. This is also a topic and a subject that uh, has lots of subtleties that, that go with it as well. We run some uh, uh, workshops, as I told you, in, in Jackson Hall every, every fall. And it was several years ago we had a, a, a woman from Atlanta. And at, at the start of each of these workshops, we ask each of the photographers to, to uh, select a topic that uh, they would like to concentrate on for, for that week. And the topic she su suggested and, and, and selected was cowboy hats. Now, it would seem like that's not going to be a very deep subject, but she proceeded to then discover all of the kinds of things that flow from cowboy hats. She photographed them uh, on ranches where they were sweat stained by people who actually wore them in their work. She did one of the two stores in downtown Jackson that sells and fits cowboy hats. And of course, one of the bars in downtown Jackson, the neon sign is of a cowboy hat. So she goes home to uh, Atlanta after, after the workshop, armed with all of these pictures, which were very original and very unique, and, and not what you would think of at all uh, when you talk about the American West or Jackson Hall. She sold a picture page of those pictures to the Atlanta Journal and Constitution. Then she thought, let me try this again. Then it was the Miami Herald. Then it was the Washington Post. Uh, all of these uh, newspapers then were buying uh, with the intrigue of the American West and a new look at it, buying her photographs of cowboy hats. And she ended up uh, paying for her, her whole trip to the workshop uh, with her pictures of, of cowboy hats. Fast forward today to William Albert Allard. Uh, who may be the best contemporary photographer working on the American West today. His photographs and those of Sam Abel, who was here most recently, uh, really have zeroed in on not just the beauty of the American West, but the life and lives of the people who populate it today uh, and make it still one of the most unique places in America. So intrigued was Bill Allard with the American rest that he bought a cabin in, in Missoula, much to his wife's puzzlement. And the American West is really very much in, in the intrigue of, of people from all over the world, principally Japan. Uh, stand at the south rim of the Grand Canyon, and you will think that the principal language of the moment is Japanese. There will be all of those people there looking and talking and, and, and capitalizing on and, and enjoying what, what we appreciate and what we like too, but you know, in, in, in a very, very kind of different way. So it was fun for us to put together the, this book on, on the American West and the exhibit. And it was nice that uh, this museum, which is a extremely well-run museum with paying a lot of serious attention to uh, contemporary and historic photography. This was a, a, a place that uh, I was most pleased chose to uh, show the, the exhibition. We started putting this together and, and it was interesting because uh, my, my number two person on this whole project uh, is Kate Glasner Brainerd. Uh, and Kate has worked for me at a couple of places before, and, and uh, she is just a, a, a really wonderful uh, book designer. But, but more than that, she's a full-blown journalist. I mean, she is looking at all of the decisions and all of the elements that have to go together into making a good book 
the pacing of a good book, uh, the page turning photographs, and integrating really good captions and, and good headlines. So Kate and I put this book together, and it was really kind of interesting because we had all of the archives of the National Geographic at our disposal, and in recent years they've been digitizing and making them available uh, for uh, serious uses that could be something like this. But it was interesting with, with uh, almost a million pictures to go through, Kate and I really came down to the ones we best remembered. And it was really kind of funny because it, it's, it's the thing that uh, as we were putting together the book and, and uh, uh, actually we did the, the curatorial work in about two days. And it was two days uh, in which we just said, uh, yeah, we got to have Sam Abel's picture of, uh, of uh, such and such. And, and it, we, we kind of knew all of these pictures. So in, in that way, it, it kind of came to, uh, to fruition in, 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 a, in a fairly quick way and, and mostly out of, out of our memory. So it's interesting that uh, when, when the book came out, uh, which has been a number of months ago now, almost a year ago, uh, it, it was really interesting that the people in National Geographic really didn't know how this book was going to do. And one of the things that uh, I insisted on the book is that we do it in a form of what I call an elegant hardback, uh, an elegant softback. Rather than uh, having a price point that would be so high uh, with, with a, a beautiful slipcase book and, and all of those kinds of things, uh, I really felt like uh, we should have an, an edition that was more affordable um, and yet still manufactured to very high quality and printed on good paper. It's just not a big hardback book which drives the, the cost way up and then everyone that wants to sell the book um, says, oh, that, that's, that's a $50 book. So I wanted something other than a $50 book. So how did it work? Uh, just fine. It's uh, the second printing is about sold out. They tell me they're about to do a, a third printing of, of the books, which is kind of interesting because it, 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 it makes this one of the better selling photographic books of, of the last year. It's also interesting that the Geographic Book Division, which this is probably because it had something to do with it. They were rather badly managed in the previous few years. And when I say badly managed, uh, they were doing market research in order to decide what books to do. They would send a brochure to 250,000 of their 5 million members. They would send a, a sampling, and they would list four books on the sampling. And whichever book tested best would be the one they actually then went and put together and sold. Kind of interesting to, to make sure you don't make a mistake. But the problem with all of that was, oh, over, over the recent years, you would do some testing, and then they would start to do the book. And a year later, the book would come out, and the testing didn't apply any longer. And what had tested well is not what people were uh, that interested in a year later. And they also tested some things, uh, you know, in which, you know, dear, do you want another book about the Grand Canyon? Uh, no, we got one, don't we? Yeah, we got one. So the, the testing wasn't working very well. So it was uh, kind of uh, a bit of a stretch for them and, and, and the geographic book division coming off a year in which they lost $6 million uh, to just say, okay, we'll, we'll try your book on the American West. So I'm, I'm pleased to report that, it, that it's doing well and it, and it hit a hit a responsive point with, with lots of people. But to me, that's not surprising because the American West is one of those things that, uh, that has a universal and a lasting appeal. Uh, the appeal that we were trying to do with it was to do a book that in, embraced both the history of the West but a very contemporary look at what's going on today with such things as looking at water issues, and water is very important in the American West. 
looking at the challenges that uh, population expansion has thrown into the Los Angeles Basin, looking at all of the things that, uh, that hurt some of the most savable and beautiful and wonderful elements of the American West, while some others are really helping to enhance its value uh, and still preserve the appreciation for which we all have for this wonderful part of the country. So it was fun and good and, and worthwhile that, uh, that Kate and I had a lot of fun. It's worthwhile that the book is, is doing well. So at this point, I think maybe, instead of talking about pictures, maybe we should look at some. So let's look at a few pictures from the American West. Let's see, I thought I pushed the right button. Uh, there's only four buttons here, and of course, I, I can't solve that. <laughs> However, the technical director is about to point out the button. The button. Okay, yeah, now I got it. This is the cover of the book. Uh, it, it's a Bill Allard picture, but it goes back 30 years, and what is so interesting uh, about this was we selected it for the cover of the book, and, and Bill says, don't you know he died a year after we took that picture back in uh, the 1960s? So it, it's interesting that we started out with a dead person. But this is just a sampling of, of pictures from the book, and, and uh, the exhibition is in the walls here in the museum, so you can look at them in, in more detail. But I think you can see at this that we were looking at, at both beautiful photographs, but also photographs that tell stories, photographs that uh, have the uniqueness of, of the place and still the people, uh, the farmers trying to gather the hay with an approaching storm. And of course, new high tech comes to the West. Uh, the wind is now useful. And this is an example of a picture that uh, includes the Milky Way uh, and a little bit of light on an arch. And this picture couldn't have been taken by Ansel Adams because this picture is only possible with today's digital ha cameras with high ISO ratings in which you could actually do an exposure short enough that the stars are not actually moving, which was always the traditional way in which you'd be a, a picture that showed stars, only way they could register on film. And this is one of the other elements and techniques uh, of, of photography today, and this picture is not taken by a photographer who was there, it is by a camera. And when the owl flew through the laser beam, it set off the camera that took its picture. Uh, and this was one of the cameras, and the Geographic has done this in a number of places now, cameras that are set up for three, four, five, six months. Uh, and at the end of that time, uh, the photographer goes back to the camera and takes a look to see what it took pictures of. And of course the book then goes way back to the early years of the American West, the uh, Oklahoma land rush. And the beauty of today in this Sam Abel picture, which I think he probably showed uh, last, last week when he was here, uh, this is one of those things that this this looked this way a hundred years ago, and it looks this way today. And this is another of the Sam Abel pictures of life of the cowboy in the American West. So that's just a, a little sampling of some of the pictures, and you can look at more of the pictures on the walls of, of the museum. So at this point, let me ask if you have any questions or anything you would like to further discuss. 
before we all retire to the museum and can look at the pictures on the wall. Yes, sir. They're, they're real. Uh, the National Geographic has a policy of no digital manipulation other than what you could have done just to adjust something for, for printing, uh, what you could have done in a dark room. Uh, it, it's the kind of thing that no image has changed. So well, what you see was what was there. Yes, sir. Most of the photographs are horizontal, but the National Geographic is a vertical publication. So, how much does that play in effect when you're actually doing the editing? Uh, not really at all. Uh, it, it's, it, the edit is, is for the pictures uh, themselves, uh, but you know, it, it's a vertical page, but there's two facing each other. So, lots of those are double trucks. They're, they're, they use both pages for a, for a single photograph. The only tricky part of that is you got to make sure in selecting pictures that a significant part of the picture doesn't fall in the gutter. And that, you know, that really, that, that could damage the, the picture. Uh, okay, can, uh, sometimes we can do that with a picture that you uh, crop a little bit off one side so something significant is falling just outside the gutter a bit. But yeah, that's, that's the only problem with, uh, with uh, the, the format of the magazine. But you know, when, then when you get to National Geographic books, some of those are, are uh, very horizontal books. Yes, sir. Yes, when Sam was here, he pointed out that he was extremely fortunate because he started National Geographic when there was essentially an open budget. In other words, he could do what he wanted and go where he wanted and stay as long as he wanted and wait as long as necessary. And I wonder how much of that has changed over the years since he started. Well, it's changed. One of the things that the, uh, I started that change, that they had a, an unrestricted budget. You're, you're right. Sam, Sam was, was right. Uh, Sam is one of those that didn't really abuse that, that, that privilege. Uh, I thought it was very important uh, uh, not to save money because there was no impetus to save money when I was there. And, uh, and I'll talk about today in a minute. Uh, I thought it was important to inject some, uh, some discipline on how a project was being done, rather than sometimes uh, just letting it go on and on and on and on. Uh, and, and a lot of that took place because picture editors were not going through the yellow boxes. That's the Kodachrome that we used to use. We're not going through the yellow boxes that were coming in, and the photographer is stuck out in northern Italy wanting to find out, well, uh, is my camera broken? Are the pictures all turning out okay? All, so it was, th th there was a lot of, of laxness in, in, in that whole thing. And yeah, there, there was no impetus to, to save money. Uh, today, there is uh, an impetus to do it in an efficient way. Uh, and that is, okay, each photographer that is now starting out on a major National Geographic story is asked, asked to turn in a budget. Uh, and there are no staff photographers at the Geographic anymore. There are a number of regulars who have contracts, but no staff photographers anymore. So every photographer starting out in a Geographic story does a budget and he or she is expected to bring the story in for that amount of money. Uh, and that amount of money is all, always quite significant. But if someone gets stuck someplace where the weather has been terrible for, for three weeks and, the, the, and they're gonna have to spend another three weeks, um, all they gotta do is to call into uh, the office and say, here's what happened, here's what I need, and then it's approved. In other words, Money is not wasted, but there is all the money that's necessary to do the stories really well, including stories that take six months to do. So that, that, that's not unusual. We had a photographer, uh, I'm told the story, I didn't, I, I wasn't there at the time, but in, in World War II, 
photographer who had been in, in China for six or seven months and had done a couple of stories there. Uh, and so this was back in the days where the founder, Melville Bell Grovinger, uh, was actually the editor of the magazine and presided over some of these things. And so it was getting towards the end of the war. So we sent a cable to this photographer in China. Uh, and, and the cable said, um, your coverage, World War II, complete. Stop. Uh, very good job you have done. Stop. Uh, now, return to headquarters. Stop. Melville Bell Grovinger, MPG. So the photographer messaged back and, and said, uh, understand him to return to headquarters. Stop. Preparing my trip now. Stop. Do you authorize bringing all my junk? Stop. And so Melville Bell Grovinger uh, sent another cable back and said, uh, authorized. Thus it was that this photographer brought a Chinese junk on the, on the deck of a freighter all the way back to the United States, parked it in the Chesapeake Bay, and lived in it for the rest of his life. <laughs> now that's, that, that's one of the expense account stories from the National Geographic. And by the way, I think we still have a car parked at the Nairobi airport. There, there, there are a number of things that, that people spent money on in, in the past because there was no limit on it. And, you know, the, the car at the Nairobi airport, that's one of those that uh, uh, everyone would say, well, you know, we'll probably be doing another story here one of these times and we'll, we'll already have a car. So <laughs> that'll be all right. <laughs> then we had a photographer that... Um, bought one of these vans uh, that uh, has a roof that rises up high, you know, so, so you can stand up in the back of it. So he was doing a story in Canada, and, and so he thought it was going to be more convenient, more opportunistic for him to, to uh, simply uh, have this van that he would live in, and it could take him everywhere he wanted to go, and if he was going to have to be someplace that he wanted the sunrise and there's no motel close, uh, he could be right there. And... and be prepared for the sunrise. So uh, he bought this van on his, his, his expense account. Uh, the unfortunate part about that was he was showing it to some people in the National Geographic parking garage and forgot that the roof was up when he drove out, drove out the garage. <laughs> so thus it was, uh, we had to have a little uh, repair on, on that van, like a whole new rising roof for for all of them. So the, the expense accounts were always a, 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 an, an interesting notion over the years, but uh, it, it's also one of those things that uh, it, it's, it, it, it's enabled geographic photographers to do things that a lot of other budgets wouldn't, wouldn't do. Yes? I think one of the great successes of National Geographic stories is the way that they integrate the photography, the writing, and the cartography, and I understand it's a really collaborative effort, but what really drives it in the beginning of getting a story going? Is it the photographer or the writer? I mean, whose idea generally is it? How does that Sto Story happen? ideas can come from everyone, uh, and, and uh, I would guess that probably at least half of the story idea, at least half of the stories originated by a photographer. Uh, and, and over the years, one of the things that I used to tell them, okay, who's going to write the story? Uh, and they would say, well, I, you know, so-and-so might, might be good on it. I said, what you need to do is to go talk to him or her and, and, and get them on board so that when the story proposal is, is presented, uh, it, it's, it's fleshed out. Uh, the, the writer and the photographer are... On, uh, on the same path, and we can see that this is going to be a, a pretty successful story. And I, I think it's, uh, that that's been one of the, they, they didn't used to do that. They, they, they used to have the photographer go out and make the pictures and then have a writer go out later and, and write about it. And, uh, you know, I, I said, okay, we, we got to change this, but the, the, the first person that, that really started doing this very effectively was Jim Richardson. And Jim Richardson would go out, and he did uh, he did a story on on, on the aquifer that, that goes across eastern Colorado, western 
uh, Nebraska and western Kansas and into the boot hill of Oklahoma. And, and he became the authority on the subject. And he began photographing the story. And the, the writer was then uh, was finished with the conflict that he had and, and went out to, to join Jim in the field. And, and Jim already knew more about the aquifer in those states than probably anyone else looking at it as a journalist and, and not as someone who's intrigued with water management or those kinds of issues because he was looking at it from all ways. And the writer was intrigued. The writer says, you know, well, this is the, the research that, that he's done makes this story easy for me. I mean, I know just where to go and I know all the, all the significant details. So research is, is very important for geographic stories. And uh, the Geographic has uh, a halfway show. About halfway through any assignment, the photographer and the writer come back to the office and show everything that they've done up to then to a group of senior editors and the editor-in-chief. Uh, and then they talk it through, just to make sure that everyone knows where it's going and see if the editors have any suggestions or if they would suggest, we don't think you're going in exactly the right direction. We think you need to do this more. When I got there, some of those, some of those meetings were, uh, well, let's, let's just say there were some people in some of those meetings that didn't really do much other than go to meetings, <coughs> uh, which I guess is the American way today. So uh, that was one of the things that uh, I, I tried to change, and, and I think it's been successful in all the years since that the, looking at that halfway show is is important to make sure that it's really going in the right direction and 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 the the key people are in in the meeting and and it's and it's well thought out and, and is useful sometimes the stories are such that there is no opportunity for a halfway meeting uh they they are at a place and a time and the photographer needs to be there uh, that entire time. So uh, I think the best thing you can say today is uh, it, it's a pretty adaptive uh, uh, atmosphere uh, dictated pretty much by the, the needs to just simply do it well and do it right. Yes? What was the most difficult story that you worked on? What made it difficult? The most difficult story that I ever worked on there... Uh, uh, I, I, I can't think of one right off. Well, they're not easy, but they're all kind of the same level of difficulty. They're, they're, they're all kind of the, the kind of thing that uh, once the story gets going, it, it's, uh, it, it's, there's a lot of logic going on. Uh, and so... Uh, they, they pretty much determine themselves. Very few stories at the Geographic are killed. It, it's, it's pretty routine these days that, uh, that they aren't. Uh, Forty years ago, uh, less than half the stories that were commissioned and photographed ever made it into the magazine. And they had kind of the luxury of being able to pick and choose and... and uh, a, a lot of stories just got assigned, just right off. And Melville Bell Grovinger was, was famous with, with his friends, and one of his friends who would, would be, was going to be virtually a tourist, who would say to, to Grovinger, uh, well, my wife and I, we're, we're going to Italy next month. And he would say, well, let me give you a Leica, and you can take some pictures, let us see them when you get back. I mean, it was, at one point it was pretty undisciplined about how things would start. Almost none of those ever resulted in the photograph being published, but, but uh, he did have a lot of Leicas around. <laughs> yes? It's pretty interesting. I was with Chris Johns this last week, who is the, the editor-in-chief right now and has just been named the executive vice president, basically in charge of all content. They, the, the circulation of the National Geographic is about 5 million now, and they're, they're, they're around 800,000 online. 
and uh, the, the online versions, and, and they're well into doing all of that, are not making much of a difference on the print uh, acceptance. Uh, and, and one of the reasons is people love uh, to save National Geographic's. Years ago, when I was living in Topeka, Kansas, my house was hit by a tornado and, and demolished. So on this uh, couple of June evenings later, some friends and I were back out at the, at, at the house and we were picking up a lot of the stuff that could be salvaged from your house being wiped out by a tornado. And my whole block was, was wiped out, but about two blocks away they had no damage at all. So it, it's a nice June evening and we're collecting stuff and putting them in the boxes in the trunk of my car. And, and this couple from a couple of blocks away were walking up and down the street and they were stopping and you know, they were looking at the wreckage and you know, commenting on your underwear in the tree and all of those kinds of things. And, and uh, I had a stack of National Geographics in, in, the, uh, in the garage. And now this is kind of a yellow streak down the driveway. As I'm coming past them carrying a box of stuff to save, this woman was turning to the man and says, there, you see how much good it does to save National Geographics? <laughs> and that's a true story, too. Yes? The transition from film to digital was, was a, a lot of people thought, ooh, this, this might not be very good. And uh, Bill Allard was one of the first ones who began using a digital camera. Uh, and he said, which he was quoted in, in, in American Photo Magazine and some other places, he says, that this is so much like Kodachrome that it's okay. <laughs> I think uh, everyone was very concerned about all of that, uh, and, and today um, no one is concerned about it at all. The quality and the opportunities on digital photography far outpace anything that we could ever do on film. Uh, and it's also one of those things that uh, you have almost instant access to it. You don't have to wait for a processing lab to develop the film. Uh, so it, it, it's more efficient in all ways, and, and not in just ways that save money. It, it's efficient in, in ways that enable you to tell the story better. So uh, uh, digital photography has just been, uh, in, in all ways of photography, it, it's, it's been a godsend, and certainly for the National Geographic. Yes? Uh, it's editorial use, and so there, there's no model agreement necessary at all unless it is being used to, for a commercial reason. Uh, and thus it is, uh, lots of people t t today, and, and I think the Geographic does this too, uh, a photograph of a person, like the one I showed here, on the cover of a book to be sold, that is one that they'll get a model release on. But pictures inside the book uh, or inside the magazine are not released. And no one has really tested that much. So, yes? I think the cover of the magazine, I, I think if it were a, a living person for whom you could, you, you could find uh, them to get a release. I, I, I think they might try to f try to get a release. Um, uh, it's 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 kind of new territory. That there's there, there's some new lawsuits that are that are pending involving athletes and their images and wanting to be paid uh, for for those it, it, within the realm of, of of news or editorial content like the National Geographic. Uh, there's uh, I'm, I'm not aware of, of uh, any legal actions that, that have resulted in, in that yet. One of the things I, I think the editors of the Geographic are, are sensitive, sensitive, sensitive to the point that they're not going to paint someone in a really terrible way uh, by, by a, a use of their picture unless they really did a terrible thing. Uh, and, and then the, the photograph would be the the documentation that, that might prove it. 
Yes. I'm curious to know how the selection of images for the exhibition was determined, since there are more in the book than in the show, and also the size of the images in the exhibition. Very arbitrarily. Okay. No. <laughs> Kate and I just, just picked them. You know, one of the things you look at when you're doing a book uh, with, with a lot of pictures in it, you're, you're looking at, at how the book is pacing and, and how it, it moves from, from uh, one spread, one page to the next, using kind of page turners from, t from time to time, pacing the book very carefully. Well, you, you need to do that successfully on a museum wall too. And uh, we were looking at, at this earlier today, and it, it's, it's nicely paced here in this museum. It, it's carefully done. One of the things that uh, when we sent out uh, these exhibitions to museums, we gave the museums a suggested pacing of, of how we envision. But every museum has different wall space and different opportunities, so we couldn't arbitrarily say you have to do it this way. We just did a, a suggestion. And we have seen how a number of museums have, have used the show now. Uh, and in all of the ones that I've seen, uh, I think it was handled very nicely. Museum curators tend to know what they're doing. Anything else that you'd like to visit about? Yes, sir. Can you comment on the archiving of the old films uh, and what they're doing uh, to store? That kind of thing. Well, they've stored a lot of that film in, in, in some of those caves in Pennsylvania and in and, and, and the salt mines in, in Kansas. Uh, but basically, all the, all the key pictures, uh, they have uh, pretty well got digitized. One of the problems that we really have is a lot of people are looking at now, is, is the digital version really that permanent? And a lot of people are saying now, okay, let's hedge our bets. Let, let, let's, let's also save them on film and maybe in a couple of different ways in, in digital because it's uh, trying to figure out how something is, is going to be useful 100 years from now, we don't know for sure. And, and the film might be longer lasting than, than the digital. I mean, I, I don't know if you've had this experience or not, but I've, I've had some, some instances in which some digital images in a storage device bled through to some others. And, and so there we were. It, it, was, it was just, it, it was not really, not, not really what we thought it was going to be. Yes. The, the originals are kept, the digital versions are kept, and then, and, in, in some instances, you know, some of that, some of those pictures were made because it was necessary for the higher film speeds on ectochrome. Um, and ectochrome does not have the keeping qualities of uh, Kodachrome for sure. Sometimes it does. The variable was in the processing. Sometimes if the processing, E6 processing of ectochrome that was off uh, or someone didn't mix the chemicals exactly right or whatever, all at once, I've, I've got some ectochromes at home that are unusable. And so they, they, they are storing it in more than one way, the key pictures. Well, it's been nice to be with you today. So Jill, would you like to take over and then direct everyone to wherever they should be directed? <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Um, please join me in thanking Rich.